Japan and Thailand are the only major East Asian states to have consistently retained their independence throughout the era of Western colonialism. Indeed, in the Second World War, Thailand, like Japan, was led by a fascistic government, which accordingly cooperated with the Japanese Empire for most of the Second World War. Thailand's fascist Prime Minister, Playak Phibun Songkram, who is commonly known simply as Phibun, was actually responsible for the name change from Siam to Thailand in 1939. This was part of the supposed Thai Cultural Revolution, as the name Thailand emphasises a Thai ethno-nationalism which was in keeping with Phibun's Sinophobic and, more generally, xenophobic political platform. Uh, as prior to this, uh, Thailand was known as Siam, that's how I will be referring to it for the remainder of this video. Relations between these two monarchies date back hundreds of years. And today I want to specifically zone in on the time period of Siam's 1688 revolution. So, the Tokugawa shogunate had, earlier in the century, effectively shut Japan off from outside influences. Uh, you may have heard before that this artificial island in Nagasaki, uh, known as Dejima, was the only port from which foreigners were allowed to trade. And even then, that essentially only the Chinese and Dutch were permitted. Uh, while this is technically true, I'd say it's uh, somewhat misleading once we consider how broad Japan's definition of Chinese trade actually was. Uh, most of the merchants commissioned by Southeast Asian states such as Siam were ethnically Chinese, and as such, uh, this constituted a kind of Chinese trade. Siam was at this time known as the Ayutthaya Kingdom and had been led by King Narai from 1656, Perhaps in contrast to the Tokugawa shogunate, uh, Narai's Siam was quite open to all kinds of foreign traders and influences, uh, from Indians to Europeans. There was a sizable population of people of foreign descent at this time as well, and there was even a Japanese settlement of over a thousand by the Siamese capital. Uh, so what we're going to be looking at here are the accounts of the events of 1688, as recorded by Chinese merchants in Nagasaki. Uh, I'll be using the version of these accounts printed in the text The Junk Trade from Southeast Asia. Uh, an account from a Siamese ship, given as Ship 150, is recorded on the 4th of August 1688. The ship states that the King of Siam has a number of powerful officials who are Chinese, Moor, and English. Uh, this is reiterated in an account from 1689, which states that the King of Siam had several senior ministers, among whom were Siamese, Moors, and English, and another from 1690, which says that in Siam there were English, Moor, and Siamese officials. Uh, it's important to note here that English was used as a general term for European people, and in a similar fashion, more was often used to describe uh, Muslims from India and Persia. Uh, so why is this information given? Uh, the first account mentions an English official, uh, who in later accounts is described as an English official named Wichayan, and an English official by the name of Okfra Kameng. Uh, we now know that this was the Greek adventurer Constance Falcon, who was promoted by King Narai to the role of Friar Wichayan. The events which follow this are presented with a variety of interpretations in the different accounts. Uh, the first one tells us that several hundred English troops were presented to the King of Siam, who liked them so much that he stationed a number of them at the checkpoint at the river mouth of the Shao Friar, and placed them under the command of uh, Old Mate Falcon. Apparently, however, a Siamese resident found a message on a tree that told them about how Falcon was in on a conspiracy to overthrow Narai, who this information was promptly uh, relayed to. Uh, the king, who had no suspicions beforehand, now had no doubts about the treachery and had Falcon executed on the 4th of June. Uh, this is repeated in an account from a ship which arrived later that day, uh, now, while absolute monarchs tend not to uh, exactly be the brightest crayons in the box, uh, something about this story isn't isn't quite adding up. You know, it 
don't know about you, seems a li- little bit, you know, a little bit ridiculous to me. An account from uh, August of 1789 states that the king's health had deteriorated and that high-ranking officials, including Falcon, had taken charge of the affairs of state. Uh, a treacherous official named Petrarca, however, uh, used this opportunity to gather over 10,000 men to start a revolt against Narai. Then, an account from August of 1790 states it was Falcon who plotted to seize the throne. And finally, a report from later that month clarifies that Petrarca had been told by King Narai, who died of illness, to succeed him. Uh, and he, after having Falcon killed, you know, peacefully ascended the throne and everyone lived happily ever after. Uh, but so, what actually happened then? Well, not only was the English official actually Greek, but the English troops were actually French. Uh, however, we do know that Falcon was sympathetic to the French, and that Petrarca, who was not only an important official, but actually part of the royal family, took charge in a kind of pseudo-nationalistic coup against European influence. And this was completed after King Narai died. Uh, I just think this kind of game of uh, Chinese whispers you see with these reports is fun to read about. And perhaps there's a lesson here somewhere uh, about the reliability of pre-modern sources.